Hello, everyone. Hello. And welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 641st New Social Environment. I'm Raven, the Special Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Sam Vernon, Fawn Krieger, Louis Osmosis, and Charlie Schultz. We're thrilled to welcome poet Andrew Lee here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded lands and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, Lenape Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts, Visual artist Sam Vernon earned her MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale University. Her installations combine Xerox drawings, photographs, paintings, and sculptural components in an exploration of personal narrative and identity with recent solo exhibitions at San Francisco's Museum of the African Di Diaspora and UT Downtown Gallery, among others. New York-based artist Fawn Krieger examines themes of touch, ownership, and exchange in her multi-genre works. Her Flintstonian tactility and penchant for scale compressions reveal an unlikely collision of private and public, where intimate moments also serve as social ruptures. Her work has been exhibited at The Kitchen, Art in General, and many other galleries. Krieger is a 2019 Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award Fellow and has received many additional grants. Born in Brooklyn, Louis Osmosis is an interdisciplinary artist working primarily in sculpture, drawing, and performance. His practice revolves heavily around craft, performative actions, and ready-mades, incorporating found objects and vernacular materials, from popsicle sticks to toilet paper tubes and hornet's nests to wood altered by beavers. And to introduce our host, writer and editor Charlie Schultz is managing editor of the Brooklyn Rail. And now to pass it over to you, Charlie. Thank you, Raven. Thanks, Lewis, Fawn, and Sam for joining me today. And thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in. Um, today, we are going to talk about Adriana Farmiga's September critics page. Um, I want to open it up by getting some of Adriana's own words um, onto the broadcast. Uh, before I do that, though, Adriana, who unfortunately is not able to join us today, and for those of you actually who don't know, probably the best place to start would be Adriana's bio. Um, Adriana Farmiga is a first generation Ukrainian American artist, curator, educator, associate dean, lap swimmer, and motel owner who lives and works in the Hudson Valley. Um, this uh, Louis Fawn and Sam is uh, directly from Adriana. She wishes me to say, Thank you to my brilliant contributors for assembling today with your enthusiasm and intellects. I'm truly sorry I can't be with you today, but I'm still working on returning back to my flow state. Please know I am with you in spirit and continue to be extremely grateful to each of you for participating in this project with me. I love you all. Um, well, Evan's moving to me. Um, so what I'd like to do now is read Adriana's um, introduction to her critics page. And uh, afterwards, uh, Lewis, Fawn, Sam, if, if, if you would listen, as, I mean, what else you would do? Uh, but uh, afterwards, I, I'd like each of you to respond to what you hear in Adriana's piece that um, maybe inspired you initially, maybe you heard it differently this time, but I'd like to open our discussion um, with a direct response to Adriana. So I'm going to, read the introduction of Adriana's amazing section straight from the paper I helped her make. Cock fucking shithead or clean flux, solder and heat. The order of operations for joining metals. In this process of metal working, flux is indispensable as a chemical agent that prevents funk, funk Jesus, funk and oxidation, though it should not be thought of as an antioxidant, like, you know, blueberries. You wouldn't want to ingest flux. It is highly corrosive, and it can actually cause a bit of drama in your joinery if it's used improperly or without precision and purpose. But as a mediating material between a metal surface and solder, flux facilitates amalgamation and generally makes for better transitions in a state of heat and flow. 
unsurprisingly, there are different kinds of flux for different base metals and solders. Sometimes I think of flux in the same way I think of a primer for paint or even a pregnant pause, a useful vehicle that makes getting from point A to point B way smoother. Like many things in the space of making, it's easy to nerd out on specifics of the material, uh, but my interests lie more in the flowy part of flux, which brings an opportunity to define it. Here's the first entry from the American Heritage Dictionary. Flux, noun, A, a flow or flowing of a liquid. B, the flowing in of the tide. C, a continuing movement, especially in large numbers of things, a flux of sensation. Flux as flow. To be in flux is to be alive. Chances are that if you're reading this, you're alive and therefore in some state of flux. My multidisciplinary art practice has consistently orbited around broader notions of flux, fluidity, transitional moments, liminality, and nuance. These days, this most manifests in conceptual still life and assemblage, but has included site-specific installation and community-based projects, always with a bent towards psychogeography and intimate autobiographical references. Flowing in, flowing out. Spring, 2022. Russia's racist, imperialist, and genocidal war in Ukraine has put me in a state of flux where abnormal psychological responses have become a daily testament to the extreme trauma of the onslaught that my family is enduring thousands of miles away. Hives, migraines, PTSD, and anxiety are all in the mix. It feels continuous, undulating. Performing polite normativity is now expected as the sensationalist window of this brutality has surpassed the bracketing window of our calibrated for social media attention spans. Plus, deadlines need to be met, bills need to be paid, and life goes on for others. As a Ukrainian born in the diaspora, I've always had to straddle two worlds, never quite fitting fully into either. Extensive travel to the Soviet Union slash Ukraine provided a wealth of contrasting experiences to a life situated in a community of political dissidents and refugees in the New York area. The dichotomous iconographies of this point-counterpoint upbringing informed my sensibilities as an artist, for which I am grateful. But since February, I've been adrift, dislodged, bereft, flowing in another mode, far from a more desirable flow state. Flow as flex. And yet, just like the compound used in soldering, the reinforcing bond of community has shown itself to be the most supportive mechanism for moving through this. We evolve, we flow. We find solace and support in our constellations of chosen family and friends. For this reason, I invited a cross section of influences, mentors, friends, colleagues, and former students to help me ruminate on the idea of flux. Each of these contributors is magical, bringing me joy and inspiration in some way. I'm grateful to you all for being in my life's orbit. Naylan Brake, Naylan Blake, David Brooks, William Cordova, Christian Hincapi, Fawn Krieger, Rin Johnson, Michael Jew, Zoe Leonard, Joy Minaya, Louis Osmosis, Elizabeth Shannon, and Sam Vernon. Thank you, Adriana. Um, where well, I have goosebumps uh, reading that. Um, Lewis, you're at the top of the screen for me. Um, what did you think when Adriana first reached out to you? What do you feel now hearing Adriana's words on the other side of the contributing experience? Um, well, when she first reached out to me, I was like, oh shit, like my former professor and I get to like on the same fucking playing ground or whatever you know what i'm saying it was like i was like oh shit like what's up like okay hi hi adriana um and you know it was uh for those that don't know like uh famiga and i call it famiga because you know as per her being like my sculpture guru at, at koopa um was was and is like truly like one of like my like art gurus and like mentors 
throughout just life in general and you know art making blah 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 um but when she hit me up about contributing a piece one i was like okay cool this is sick because this is the first time i can do some writing that isn't immediately tied uh to my art making and two um i kind of wanted to i kind of I kind of have like a like some sort of gauge as to how like she writes and her take on things. So I wanted to like really lean into like my like insipid like bullshit ways of writing as like a kind of like foil to that. At least that's kind of kind of how like I, I thought about it. Um, and so obviously I got wrote it before reading her intro, but when the section about the section about the Ukraine conflict the part that specifically the part about uh, the performativity, I think is really part and parcel to my piece for the uh, issue in so far that I've always, like when I heard the word flux and flow, I kind of wanted to take it not, I wanted, there's like, there's like a, how do I put it? It's kind of like one of those buzzwords that was used a lot in critique in art and art school as this kind of like end all be all to how like a work is to function. And I think, which is like not necessarily a bad thing at all. I think like it's a lot of works that are made in art school are made to succeed in art school, not necessarily like out in the world. And so um, there's a lot of, it kind of became in my head like a place hold, a placeholder for a work that could lend itself to like the associative uh, circle jerk that is the critique economy. And so I kind of wanted to lean into like the flux and the flow thing on a, as, it, as it functions in a more like insidious in economy. So I thought a lot about like perversion um, and just perverts in general. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, oh, trench coats, like flashes, like, <laughs> like um, uh, Wall Street. <laughs> um, and this was like right around the, this is like right around the time Balenciaga did like the, you know, super viral uh, fashion moment thing. Um, and I also have like a thing for a lot of like schluck movies. So like assassin movies, I have like a, a like love that shit. Um, you know, you, uh, you put me, you put Song Soleil next to like Salt next at my, uh, with Angelina Jolie. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm gonna tell you, you know? Um, so yeah, but yeah, long story short, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm like very proud of like what I've done for this. It felt very from like not beyond my heart, but like from like my gut. Um, and it was cool to kind of get that little like post Cooper, like, like colleague affirmation from someone who I looked up to like day in, day out, you know, also me and Famiga have the same birthday. So boom, hello, crazy. Oh, wow. Thanks, Lewis. Um, fun, fun. Same question. What did you think when you uh, got the invitation? What did you feel differently upon hearing the introduction now? Um, yeah, a lot of thoughts go through my head. <clears throat> um, I think Adriana and I share a, a sort of um, humbling with words. Um, uh, you know, like any visual artist writing something with words is a translation of sorts. And so there's both like a moment of um, just deep humbling and awe of, of putting feelings to words, but also like a really daunting task. So when uh, Adriana initially asked me, I felt of course so honored and also um, that was followed up by like, you know, a moment of crisis. <laughs> what do I, what do I write about? Um, and of course she, she kept her, uh, her introduction um, a secret. So I didn't get to see that until it was published, which was exciting. But I, I do have to say that um, I thought about, you know, what is it, how does one begin to talk about this idea during this time? And, um, and no, really no better person than Adriana, um, yet I, I didn't know how to uh, follow in those footsteps. And um, 
it just was a matter of circumstances that I, I happened to be in Tallinn, Estonia for the month of August. And so I knew that I would be writing it, uh, this piece there, um, which kind of recalibrated my sense of the moment being in such close proximity to the border with Russia and within another country that has endured the traumas of Soviet occupation. Um, and so it's, it's particularly sort of poignant to um, be invited prior to that and then work through this piece that I wrote there. Um, in a way, I don't think I could have written it here. Um, and then to come back to her introduction was really kind of like a full arc. But I should say that we had a funny conversation when she first invited me um, because uh, we were talking about flux and I was so excited and I thought, okay, I'm going to write about like learning how to solder at age eight. My father um, was an electrical engineer and taught me when I was very young to solder. And I loved the smell. I was like so into it. Like I couldn't wait. I, I needed to learn how to do it. And Adriana was like, that's great, you can talk about that. And then I thought, you know, maybe it's too personal in this certain kind of private way. And then um, I thought, oh, I'm gonna write about like this, uh, my partner's German and every year we do this ritual called Bleigießen, which is when you melt, like at the new year, you melt uh, liquid metal, historically lead, but of course it's toxic, so it's, changed to other metals into like a bowl of water and then it, it immediately hardens and takes a form and you read that form as a kind of clairvoyant message for the year to come. So I thought of this idea then of flux as a kind of medium um, and then Adriana <laughs> we're talking about these two ideas and then I realized Oh my God, that's right. Flux is not the actual metal. It's the it's the like the liquid that you use to clean the metal to attach, and and I I said to Adriana, Oh my God, shit! I just realized it's not that. And she was like, I just came to the same epiphany, and we both like had this crisis of like, Oh, we have to reroute. Um, uh, but so then in the end, my process ultimately was one of like. Uh, trying to find a language for a space that's in between words. Um, you know, in the way flux is like both the substance and an anti-substance, like the absence of a substance that allows other substances to bond mm -hmm. and like how to find a way to move words around where they can speak to that space uh, of invisibility um, or, or transition. Um, so yeah, I guess that was my process and our sort of conversations leading up to it. Thanks, Juan. That was really fascinating to hear. And I have some questions and thoughts about what you said, but I, I'm first curious to hear what Sam, what Sam's feelings were on, on the same question. Sam, when, uh, when Adriana invited you and then how things feel different upon hearing or having read her introduction. I think, um, first of all, I just want to say that Adrienne is just an amazing human being. And so um, when she approached me to contribute to um, the Brooklyn Rail, which I've been reading since I was a teenager, um, I was like, absolutely, hell yes, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. But then to read her introduction and to um, feel her words and know that um, she's referred to this group of people as chosen family community, um, as well as um, on Instagram, her uh, her soccer team <laughs> was a very, I think um, it just made me it it made me understand uh, closeness during such a difficult time of of unrest for her personally. i um, dealing with the war in Ukraine and the impacts on her family and. Um, her community knowing that myself and others who contributed to, to this issue have held her down, um, have um, provided support in, in needed times. And so uh, I try to just really reflect on that after reading um, her, her essay. 
But before I read the essay, I, um, I told her, you know, I'm doing a deep dive into Benjamin Patterson. Ben Patterson is like on my mind uh, right now. Uh, and I most likely will be doing something involving <laughs> him as an artist. And, um, you know, Benjamin Patterson was, there is no flux this movement without him. Um, and so he's an iconoclast, a provocateur, um, he's a trickster. Um, I think he's someone who makes you smile and someone that you can engage with. Um, I think he's really what a good artist, all the things a good artist should be. Um, and while I was conceptualizing what I wanted to contribute to the issue, I thought, you know, maybe it's best to just let Benjamin speak. <laughs> in conversation um, and allow his personality and um, quirkiness and uh, laughter to really um, imbue, I think, a, a, a level of breath um, that we, we need in, in a state of flux. But there's also the, the notion that flux involves play and um, joy and that it is it can be improvisational and it, and it can be unpredictable. Um, and so I, I wanted to just focus on um, the conversation uh, that I, I found um, and wanted to just offer up a excerpt of the transcript. Thanks, Sam. Um, it was an amazing transcript. And as someone who works with uh, a minimum of four transcripts per issue, six years on now, um, I have a special fondness for transcripts that retain the spoken spoken language, the vitality of it, the, the hemming and hawing, um, and even the errors. Uh, one of the funny things I learned reading your piece, um, one, a card game called Flux exists. And uh, this card game is a game in which the rules are constantly changing. So you might be winning uh, in one moment, you might be losing in the next moment. Um, what I thought was also remarkable, and you, you've got to appreciate, Sam, I'm a ruthless fact checker because like, if there's one thing, it's proper nouns, uh, must be correct. And uh, so I'm reading the piece. And I'm like, huh, a gift from Randy and Kate. You also got to know I love gifts. Like the idea of gifting and gift giving is a real sweet spot for me so I start looking like Randy and Kate uh turns out not Randy Andrew Andrew Looney and Kate Looney um were the ones who made flux and uh and there's another story about Andrew being a friend of Benjamin's and giving it to Benjamin and one of the things I loved in like the short amount of time it took me to learn this neat anecdote of art history is that um the loonies were uh, like high level NASA scientists before they decided to become board game uh, and card game entrepreneurs. Um, what Ben Patterson had to do with their transition from, uh, you know, classified science to board games, um, perhaps, perhaps we'll find out in, in your research. Um, another two things I wanted to think, pull out from your piece uh, the Grand Theft Auto. Uh, ben Patterson is talking about uh, the Grand Theft Auto done Fluxus style as his ideal video game, which sounds amazing. I'm, I'm curious, Sam, if you have any thoughts on what that would look like. And the other thing I loved is when Patterson says, the golden age of flux. What a phrase to find for Adriana's page. The golden age of flux, the video game. Um, so just to ping pong it back to you, Sam, uh, what do you think about video games, the golden age of flux? Did you know this story about Sam and the loonies? Yes, I actually went back as well um, to, to do a, a, a go down the rabbit hole of their website um, for the flux game and their origin story, which is very extensive. They, so you know, extensive. <laughs> I mean, that that's a whole episode of, of 
of this um, program in, in of itself. But um, I think really what the takeaway was is that yes, they, they were um, really, really wanting to push this 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 game like they 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 were not going to stop like it's just and i and i think that their tenacity to um to 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 focus on the game and to have so many different versions of it now um uh is somehow very deeply related to the practice of ben patterson in of itself just like a deep commitment right um, and then there's also this, yeah, this, uh, this, this thing where the video game, I mean, the metaverse, right? I mean, we are, we're, we're right, I think we're probably right there. I, I, I would, if, if, if Ben was still alive, I, I would want to talk to him about where we are with, um, not only in the art world, but uh, just as, 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 you know, folks that, may or may not participate in um, uh, what AI and other technologies offer us, but there's a sentience that I think um, he would want to explore. So uh, it's, it's, it's likely that um, I will continue working with this as material and see I'm not I'm not by any means a programmer but you know he mentioned like finding a geeky programmer to do some of this work and yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll see what I can do on on that. Uh, Lewis there's a couple of things Sam said that made me think a lot about your piece I mean for one playfulness and inventiveness are two adjectives I associate very much with the club of Joe Schmo. Um, I also understand this image that you submitted is in some form of AI, although I may be wrong, I don't really understand this image. Maybe you can speak to it. Yeah, it's um, it's like, you know, recently that the Dali D A L L dash E um text to image generative thing. Um, I, I I'm I like really like the and this is like the beta version of it, not like the one that people have to pay. It's fifteen cents per generation for like the new one, which is fucking criminal to me but that's fine um but so this is the beta one and so the image quality is a lot more shit and i think it kind of lends itself to uh like i like to think of it on like a more optimistic side because there is a lot of there is a part of me that gets really doomery with it um that i have to you know reel it in a little bit but um the program is cool in so far that it kind of uh as like a visual exercise forces you to put things together in like the same context that you normally wouldn't for like a bit but in like a very quick um like uh semi-automatic like fast pace like you know you like you're like uh uh pixar lamp on a horse in abu dhabi and you get that and you're like okay i need another one it's cool it's like it's like a nice like you know it keeps your muscle from like going like flabby right um and so this was uh this was one that i kind of had on on deck for a little bit. I had like a whole like folder of them, but they were all, I like love a good pun and I love like taking puns seriously, like taking things at face value. And the the thing with the flux and the flow, um, especially in regards to what I was saying before about, um, I guess, approaching it from this more, how it, how it uh, is seated in like a more insidious economy. Um, the slippery bastard comes to mind. You know, you slippery fucking piece of shit like that, like that fucking that fucking guy. Um, so I started typing that in, <laughs> and it kept giving me a cartoon that I could not place as to where this data set was coming from. So I was like, and I didn't like the cartoon. It was really like, it was like, man, it was like really like ugly looking. It wasn't a cute cartoon, and so. I was like, okay, like, let me dress up the slippery bastard. And then also um, maybe try giving it a certain uh, allocated to like a certain time period or like a certain mode of dress. So I think if I remember correctly, this was a, a slippery, uh, a cast of slippery bastards in leather trench coats in the style of Irving Penn. Um, hence the, the black and white sort of like uh sort of like aspirational paparazzi-esque 
uh, moment that like with how like the lighting is working here. Um, I also like it too because it, it kind of looks like there there's like a there's like a puff of smoke on like the 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 person in the in the foreground. Um, I don't know. It was just like this really smooth brain approach to try and uh, have another entity other than me the, do the work of depicting the menace. Um, you know, to the to the to the point of like flux and flow. In the same way that I thought about like the proverbial slippery bastard, um, I also had kind of was revisiting this trope, and this is something that like I've I've thought about for a long time and it's also kind of sculpture bait to a certain extent so I'm like eh on it but whatever is the whole thing of quick change like you know like magicians do it illusionists do it uh, assassins in movies do it you know whatever where they like I mean I mentioned it in the piece but you know they like put like run through the crowd put on like sunglasses a scarf pull out like a jacket from somebody's waist and they're like oh I'm somebody else now um and yeah I don't know it was uh yeah, and I, lo I love the trench coat thing too, because it's kind of like um, as close as one can get within, uh, I guess, modern cinematic tropes to like how the invisibility cloak works in Harry Potter. You know, it's like, it's weird that it's like the closest sort of, um, how do I put it? The, the closest proxy to this collective understanding of how anonymity can get you from point A to point B. And yet, like historically, the garb, the wardrobe, in and of itself, is super uh, tethered to the wealth criminal, you know. So I was like, oh, cool! Like the wealth criminal is really like the most like piece of shit. Like let's fucking go. Like let's let's lean into it, you know. And like, um, yeah, yeah. Also, as for like the writing style too, uh, you know, you ask an artist to write something. I think the first. Um, or someone who doesn't fancy themselves a writer, I should put it like that. Um, you ask them to come up with a, a writing thing. I think across the board, for the most part, people are gonna be like, e, like, e, got, like, oh no, like, oh shit. Um, which I definitely have all the time, even though I write all the time. Um, but I was like, oh shit, like people might actually read this book. So um, I really uh, like to look into artists who are working now, who, you know, existed in the past, what have you, uh, who have writing practices, because I think like the best writers in my eyes tend to be artists who admit that they are bad writers. So like Popel's kind of like a really great example. And like I've fully bitten his writing style um, because he writes in a bullet point form format um, a lot of the time, which I really appreciate because in a sense, if I were to, um, if I were to like word it, it's like, um, prioritizing poetics over uh, actual poetry. Um, poetics being like the mechanics of how these things register with like a viewer, a witness, an audience member, whatever. Um, and the bullet point, like formally, um, it looks like a stanza, but it's like uh, been kind of like reaped of, um, of any, like, um, I don't know, like uh, burden, burdened like canon of what poetry is you know like poetry hot take poetry is kind of like the painting of writing you know what i'm saying so it's like ah, like a lot to deal with so here's the bullet point like let me give you a list instead which like i love you know it still has like the look the feel of a stanza but registers in like a different uh tone of urgency that i really enjoy and he's a cheeky guy and i'm a cheeky guy so i'm like okay cool great fantastic um yeah so man Oh, and Peter, Peter Halley, Peter Hawley, Halley, he's also fantastic. Yeah, he's also a fantastic, like, artist, writer guy, but in a very different way, because he's super dogmatic. Um, and I also think that's cool, too. So I kind of try to, like, tap into that a little bit, but, you know, boom, yeah. Yeah, I can, your writing is so full of imagery and um, so lacking in the rules of structure and grammar that I would enforce upon those writing pros that publish in this magazine. Um, uh, fun. One of the things that Lewis was saying that made me think about your comment earlier was this idea of translation. Um, Lewis was describing how the image that's on screen was a translation uh, from word to text. You were talking about the piece also as a type of translation. 
And I was reminded when thinking about this that, you know, Adriana is first and foremost an artist and not a writer. You know, and as Adriana told me, um, English isn't even the language that she grew up speaking. So I, you know, I, I, I just want to, I just want to express that so that everybody appreciates the depth of like vulnerability that Adriana went through for this moment. Um, because, you know, it, it, uh, it was not a quick yes. Obviously from, from the introduction, it's quite clear that it was a challenging time for her and that she used this opportunity to strengthen bonds that ultimately potentially strengthened health, hopefully. Um, but I want to stick on this idea of translation and one thing turning into another thing. Um, and maybe, Fawn, you can talk about it a little bit uh, as you think about it in terms of how, yes, thank you for putting that on screen, Raymond, that's perfect. In terms of how these pieces come together, um, how, how the two different forms uh, intermingle, mix, perhaps change in ways you don't expect when you're making them? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, um, yeah, I mean, I share this process of, of translating. Words are so daunting, and it's really another process to write. Um, and something that's also like really creative, but like a, a very, um, it is really vulnerable. So, but I, so I just want to honor what you said about that. Um, but um, mainly what I'm doing is I'm working with, um, ceramic forms that I fire. So those are the colored uh, forms in this piece. And then um, I'm squishing them um, in with concrete, um, concrete between. Um, and I am uh, videotaping the process of making each one. And I am thinking of these um, sort of initially existing as sculpture, but really actually artifacts of an event or a performance. Um, and so a kind of uh, material result of, of like a moment that can't happen again. Um, and I think of the materials both as those that record body memory and pressure um, and action, um, through the body. Um, and this is like super interesting to me. Um, like when, you know, I talk about quantum mechanics in my short piece, um, I'm super interested in this because like this idea that when you zero down to like the very, the smallest possible measurement of physical form, you see energy instead of matter. Um, and so the idea of making sculptures that um, essentially hold energy as form is like a, a kind of record of, of something that um, almost is, is so complicated to visualize. Um, and because we're locked into dimensional space, it's very hard to conceive of like other dimensions or energy that is not constrained by form. Um, and as a sculptor, this is like really fascinating to me, like in part, uh, uh, my field of sculpture is determined by the fact that I work with matter with three dimensional things, yet I work with those things because they are somehow the closest um, indicator of something beyond an energy that that uh, is exists in matter, but but is unseeable, unknowable, because we're also sculptures. We're also three dimensional forms, um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's not like translation in like one language to another, but it's a this this thing about like, um, you know, how does matter hold energy? And and then I think the next question: what what's held in that energy? Like, what is the memory in our bodies? And how how do how are the ways we can utter 
that don't take the form of language. Um, and I guess I started asking that question because I started thinking about also the implicit violence in, in written language, like, and um, what, and all of the other languages that preceded written language that aren't acknowledged as language. As a visual artist, this is like really important to me, like that, you know, are the paintings that we see in caves, are those written language? And we don't as, a cult, as cultures acknowledge those as language and like what happens through that process. Um, so uh, I'm thinking a lot about like, um, what our bodies store, um, how to tell those stories in the primary language of the body. And um, both as an act of keeping it true to the language, but also as an act of, of not translating into another form. Um, and there is also a commitment to that process, which has to do with looking at what's in my own body and like reflecting on that. And that's like more of a simultaneous process, like um, of like coming, you know, of, of meaning making for myself and, and um, understanding. Yeah, thanks, Fun. You said so much. Uh, my pen couldn't keep up, couldn't keep <laughs> up with all the things that I wanted to write down. Um, I, I, the idea of body memory has become something I've talked a lot with about people uh, over the last three years, and uh, you know, trying to appreciate more the, the the intelligence of the body as is distinct from the mind. Um, all the all the things that come through our sense of touch um, that route through our nervous systems uh, prior to having to go through our brains. Um, these things seem. For me, they were accentuated during the moments of enforced isolation during the pandemic and having to recreate routines with my body um, and then having to understand why the body was revolting uh, against some of those routines. Um, yeah, I think someone, uh, someone else talked about reflux, uh, you know, and talking about uh, the idea of flux in, in the body. Um, yeah, and it's really... Yeah, it's just really a profound, a profound place to to pause. And I think I would like to pause here, um, and pass the microphone to my colleague Raven, who um, who who may be collecting questions and answer questions, not answers, questions from uh, from our our illuminist audience. Um, I'm just so thankful for those of you who could join us today, and, and uh, I look forward to hearing uh, how this conversation opens up with the audience. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Um, our first question is from our very own Ty. Um, so you should be able to unmute. Hey, y'all. Um, I, uh, well, one, I want to thank you all for this conversation. I'm, I'm on the editorial team and uh, I see a lot of critics pages and um, Everyone in the office knows that I won't shut the fuck up about this one. Um, I'm such a fan of all of, of all of the writing in here. Um, and being such a fan, I guess uh, I wanted to know if uh, there were more specifically than just like favorite other pieces from the other contributors. I wanted to know if there were specific lines um, of the other pieces that stuck out to you um, because I've been like, I've been walking around and just like, like, I think that if there were no social things stopping me, I would just be like shouting like lines at people from the critics page. Um, and like, yeah, so I want to know kind of what, what you guys think of all of that. And if you have ones that you've been shouting from the rooftops. Um, thank you so much for that question, and thank you for um, just working on this uh, with us and celebrating it. I would I want to shout out uh, Ren Johnson's books in three parts. I think it's just so beautiful. Um, I do not pursue quietly; I devour. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, that one that, you know, just starts off with the, with the you know, all, all of my, you know, I got goosebumps just from that first line and then it just kept going. So um, I think, I think that I'll be thinking about this piece uh, for quite some time, but uh, it just, it kind of like, it's like a roller coaster of emotions of peace and, and thinking about it geographically, like how, how we are embodied and, and entangled in, in different parts of the world and what we bring to our intimate relationships in flux as well was um, deeply moving to me. And in, in the same piece, he says a mouth can be an opening, I think. And like, that's such a sculptural writer line to me. So yeah, thanks. I want to shout out my Rin Johnson line that I have underlined. I push clay. I make the same vessel over and over again. Yeah, I wanted to. Um, well, also, I'm biased here because Nayland Blake is like one of my fucking like favorite like fucking like like up there. Um, but uh, they're they they're, they're uh, in my dream. Uh, well, for when I when I saw the in my dream thing, I was like, oh, this sounds like an Evanescence song. Like this is hot. Like like in my dream, you know. But uh, they wrote uh, there was what was it? It was like brick ass or some shit. It was like this like stupid acronym. So good. Um, it was like hold on, I have it. I have it up. It was like where the fuck is it? Oh yeah, in my dream, P and then R are back and forth or back from death out of a soccer game. This tender hangouts with reminiscing about San Francisco. R has invented a con contraction. Being a rich asshole becomes a brick ass. <laughs> I asked him how we met. Pat P's head and my love for them is almost unbearable. Um, I mean, like, I, I like love Nayland's piece uh, for, the, for the reason that like, as I was reading it, 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 it became very clear that this is like, this is a, uh, the prerequisite for the writing here is redundancy. I don't know if it's repetition. I would say it's more redundancy because, you know, there's like the war holy and like uh, commandment that's like repetition means like it results in meaninglessness. I don't know if Warhol would say that, but like, you know, that's what people say. Um, whereas like with redundancy, I think it kind of points to this kind of, uh, I don't know, like turmoil laden like figure that could like reside in your head. And so this is like in my dream, like I'm in my bag, like in my dream, I don't even know what I want. In my dream, like I'm fucked still, you know, like da 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 da. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's almost like cannibalistic in that sense. Um, and then, and then Michael Drew's piece, again, soft spot here. This is kind of like, you know, bait for me, but like any sort of like syntax, synt syntactical, syntactical, uh, parameter that one sets up for themselves that could read even slightly like a Beckett move I'm like okay I'm all here for it and to get rid of all the spaces in between the words I'm like okay great because um uh, the the one line that stuck out to me was like uh what was it it was like I don't I don't like authority and I was like same <laughs> I was like oh my god same um but to have it like read within like this this uh this uh, stream of consciousness consciousness thing that is less so derived out of content and more out of like a formal lack in the composition of the writing, which is to, you know, delete the spacing between uh, words. That's like a clever way to go about that. Um, again, to point back to was this like, um, I don't know, tumultuous mode of aspiration of like what one may, may or may not want. Um, and yeah, like Nayland's Nayland's piece is kind of like I don't know, like taking like lucidity to task. I don't know, like like uh, which is really that's kind of how I thought about it. I couldn't I couldn't help but to think that Nayland's piece seems to be very aware of this, like in the same way that I talk about flux as this kind of like end all be all like aesthetic end for a lot of like folks. Um, Nayland seems to understand that like lucidity is kind of especially in the context of the dream is almost like like oh yeah like yeah that's the shit right there you know that's what like when artists talk about dreams you know what i'm saying like i'm sorry like at the end of the day if you tell me about your dream i don't give a fuck i'm 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 i'm, I'm zoning out you know what i'm saying um and this points to that sort of like conflict that's like embedded within that um 
Yeah. Love Nayland Blake. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll second that. Um, <laughs> I think like Nayland always seems to kind of be like, there's like a, he's kind of a hero for other artists. And he kind of like has this way of expanding a conversation that is um, joyful and funny and um, so sharp. Um, and I just, he, remind, he reminded me of all that's possible. Um, so I'm grateful for that. But just to sort of add um, something, I, I loved both Sam and Lewis's and I will mention that I, I love, I mean, simply because Lewis, you didn't talk about your piece this way. And I think it's one of the things that I really loved about it is that it, it, it almost talks about time without talking about time or it moves through time. And it made me think about flux as, a, as time. Um, a certain kind of time that almost feels like cinematic where like, you know, the screen will go black and then it, 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 it's filled with color and information again, but like another time has happened. And um, I appreciated the opportunity to think of Flux uh, as a kind of record in that way. Yes. Hey, can, I, can I say something to that real quick? That's so crazy. Because, um, well, GE, shout out to GE, what's up? Um, just said, uh, and jump cuts. Because I was, I was like high key uh, trying to reference those like, I don't know if Roger Ebert ever like actually did it himself, but you know those like really like jalopy type of like uh, film critic like, like videos where they're like, you know, those like armchair psychologist type of, type of thing. And they're like, they're, like uh, you know, and uh, Scorsese's usage, like da da da, and then they'll like cut to like a scene from the movie that they're talking about, and then cut back to them in this like empty amphitheater thing. Like I was really thinking about uh, uh, cultural diagnosis and critique as like the only gauge for some idea of like chronology or time with the thing that like that like you can do that with uh, via posturing yourself as a critic. Cause I was like, oh wait, I'm gonna be on the critics page. Like, I guess I'm a critic on this page, man. Like, let me fucking lean into that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know. But yeah, what? Cool. Thank you, Fawn. Uh, I also want to point out, uh, uh, Fawn, you you describe uh, Cesura as referencing a pause or a cut. Um, so you know the 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 relationship between time cutting and uh, what's happening in your artwork and how you're thinking about it and where Lewis went in his um, writing, it, there's, there's a lot of uh, symbiosis uh, occurring there quite naturally. And another thing Lewis said that, that I found interesting and I hadn't thought of was um, how Michael Jew's piece, one way of considering it is that he, he removed all of, the, all of the gaps between all of the words, uh, which to me, also seems like so related to what you're doing in so far as he got rid of every single pause and you seem like you really just want to dig into a pause. Um, yeah, and these are just uh, like interesting threads that I hadn't noticed were braided together and I'm sure there's a lot more of them uh, when we can all sit with it. Um, our next question is from Eleanor. So, um, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Raven. And thank you, everyone. Um, it's been such a fabulous conversation today. Um, my question is, um, it, you know, other than the kind of uniting obvious theme of flux in this critic stage, uh, what other like overlaps or parallels or connections do you all think there are between different contributors? Or are there any pieces that you think particularly go really hand in hand? Anyone can um, that one. Yeah. Yeah. If, um, if, Correct me if I'm wrong, but Sam, you, you, your, your, your thing was like, was like, you took a pre-existing uh, transcript and just like put it 
in in this, right? Right. It was. It's. Um, it can be found on the uh, on the Smithsonian website if you just like go on. It's a much longer. Trend. It's a. Yeah. Very, it's actually a very very long conversation. But I found it in the uh, Smithsonian Archives of American Art website. And uh, I've, I've read and I'm researching the entire transcript, but I decided to excerpt that part and put it in. Yeah, I I like, I was so into that. I was just like, wow, this is just like a gesture. This is like, so like, like this is like, and I say this like, like with the, with the best like meaning behind it. It was like, it, when I saw that, I was just like, oh, it's giving like plop, you know, which is like super cool to kind of like, um, you know, in regards to the prompt of flux to approach it with the plot, which is like a very like, like, oh, like, you know, like this anchored type of thing. Because it's like, you know, like uh, anytime one approaches like a found object with a ready-made, you know, it has like a like a paralyzing sort of like presence to it. Um, you know, it, it kind of, uh, it, it, it kind of has like a self-seriousness to it, especially like in this like contemporary world of like art making. And so when I read it, I was just like, oh, wait, where the, where, the, where the fuck is Sam? Oh, this is so sick. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's super cool. Um, and I say that to the overlap thing, because, you know, I like to use, um, as was said before, my, my my little intro thing, you know, I like to use, like, hornet's nest, <laughs> you know? Or like a fucking, I don't know, or like a, a mannequin, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 interesting that you say like where am I in the piece because I find I'm like deep I'm like actually embedded in the piece, but mm -hmm. it's just um, the preface about uh, uh, art history is kind of where I wanted to start, and, and it says any art history, hmm, any art history, no, no, I stayed away from that. Why, you know, that was the past, you know, and I think many of the contributors are. I'm thinking of William Cordova's piece, like really trying to um, deal with the past and negotiate it. And, and I really loved his piece actually. Um, it, has, it has so much in it. It's, there's like recipes, there's storytelling, there's all of these um, um, facts that I, I mean, I, I learned that Basquiat lived in Puerto Rico at the same time of a, a, a huge poster movement. And that's maybe particularly why he was um, incorporated Incorporating um, certain kinds of like Xerox copy um, imagery and, and also um, posters in, in, into his work. And so the idea of the ready-made is as a, as a starting point rather than, as you said before, I think an end point or uh, a conclusion. Um, it, it just, I mean, his piece created a lot of um, openings for me in, in terms of thinking about art historical um, context and how artists arrive um, on their um, on their material and, and their gestures and so and also thinking about Basquiat as um, Haitian and Puerto Rican you know because his mother was uh, was um, was uh, was from Puerto Rico so you know trying to you know kind of draw these these lines of, of identity and politics but also um, the 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 art and and um, how how we encounter our material and then how we talk about it because Benjamin Patterson and and this short um, exchange and, and I, I recommend that people read this it's like a great conversation but he he gets he wants to get away from autobiography a, a lot within the conversation and really just talk more about um, his path. And, and the many different careers that he had and, and how one thing led to the next. And, and it, it wasn't, it, it, it's not very, it's not, it's not neat by any means. It was no, it was no set trajectory, he kind of like followed the work. You know, if he wanted to compose, he, he did that. If, you know, once, um, you know, things with fluxes didn't work out, for him as much, he kind of moved away from that. He also held like administrative art jobs, like all these things. So um, it really, at the end of the conversation that I've, I've contributed when he says like, um, one of the adv advantages of being the last is that no one contradicts you. 
anyone wanted to contradict me, were you there? It's almost like, you know, that's a badass <laughs> moment when you get to an age to, to, to kind of be able to pro proclaim that you have something that no one can take away from you, right? Um, so uh, I, I, I really feel that there, that's the overarching theme for me with a lot of the pieces is that there's this, um, this ownership that we're taking up of, of the unknown, um, but also that we're, we're onto something and that we have questions about that. Well, it's also it's also cool to the Benjamin because I fucking I also love Benjamin Patterson. I mean, like the fucking the 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 was it the paper piece? I mean, the one that like everyone knows. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's love that piece, right? But I love that quote about the one that you just uh, quoted, Sam. But it's kind of like this like really calm uh, sort of turn away from some sort of like positivistic approach to like. Um, affirmation or whatever it's just like like yeah there's no there's no witnesses like like it's just me I was like like what's up like they're not here there's no you know what I'm saying like the participants there's no participants therefore I'm the only like sort of like ambassador to myself right like it's it's like a really I don't know just like a really um artist artist type of approach to it you know what I'm saying like yeah Wow, that was a, a crazy alliteration. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Eleanor, for your question and everybody for your Thank answers. You um, our next question is from GE and you should be able to unmute. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Hey. Question for the creatives, especially, isn't dealing with flux as flow, as flowing in and flowing out and flex and all the rest of it, isn't it really just a matter, not just, but isn't it a matter of composing the holes? Holes as in H-O-L-E-S or yes, W? Yes, but interesting you said that, but yes, H-O-L-E-S, the gaps, the, the voids, you know, that kind of thing or non-voids, but just those spaces of holes. I know, I know in poetry, we often compose the holes, you know. Well, I think, you know, I think of flux like with soldering, it's, it's like a, it's a, I'm not, a lubricant is not the right word, but it's a kind of facilitator of two other entities that come together. Um, so, um, I guess one way of looking at it is it, it, it creates a seamless bond, but, um, and that could be argued eliminates holes. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that, like, I think of it necessarily with like flux as the goal is to eliminate the holes. I think holes are actually kind of very interesting, but um, yeah. Well, that's why I meant about more co composing them more than, you know, eliminating them, you know, like playing them, using them, you know, finding that, that energy inside them and going forward, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think um, just to quickly respond to that, when I think of holes, I also think of uh, like what can be put inside of them, right? So um, a lot of what we're trying to do here is put something inside of some, you know, something else, not, not always out of lack um, or um, out of a void, but um, sometimes to, to see what can fill you know, what, what can like fill that hole. And I was thinking about, again, William um, Cordova's contribution where he mentions, um, he writes in a rare interview with New Art International Magazine published in uh, October of 1988, um, Basquiat stated, I've never been to Africa. I'm an artist who has been influenced by his New York environment, but I have a cultural memory. I don't need to look for it, it exists. It's over there in Africa. That doesn't mean that I have to go there or live there. Our cultural memory follows us everywhere, wherever we live. Um, I think that that's a really important hole for 
um, to like to present like where we are, um, where our body exists and takes up space versus where we may project ourselves <laughs> or, way, or ways in which we want to compose holes and fill gaps in the work. And, and, and I think the imaginary space of, of where that can go is limitless. And so your question is a good one. And, and I think why, why I, I make art for sure is to, is to do that. Yeah, and to the, to the thing of holes, the um, artists love holes. Um, me included, uh, but I think I think the when I hear holes, the first person I tend to think of is Katie Nolan, who I think is like the 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 professor of the, the connoisseur of holes, if I do say so myself, um, because uh, her usage of it kind of like flipped the script on the hole, where it usually is about this sort of like implied, um, I guess, I guess <clears throat> osmosis, um, but. But she kind of flipped it on his head where, where uh, the whole is like a really good means to reinstate the opacity of that which frames the whole. So like we take into like, we take the flag with like the holes in it. We take like those, um, those um, uh, uh, the cutouts of like Lee Harvey Oswald or whoever with like the holes in it. Um, it's to like reinstate the opacity of it. And it's also funny too, because in the whole especially for her type of work in like the Kunst format, like the hole is only filled in by like the white cube, which is like funny, haha. Um, but yeah, I get. I mean, yeah, to, to your point about the flux thing being like this uh, construction of just the holes or whatever. I mean, I don't know, I think, I, I think that's a pretty good way to put it. Cause you know, when I heard flux and flow, I kind of was like, I prioritized the flow thing because it made me think the two together made me think of accessibility first and foremost. Um, you know, who's like granted that and or and to those who aren't granted that, how you get how do you get that? Um, even if you fail like spectacularly, there's like something to be gleaned from that. Um, and it's also like this this whole idea of like lack and like have not um, that, you know, yeah. Yeah, Popel has that quote, like, uh, the whole is but a threshold, the whole is but an opportunity. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. If I could just also quickly add that um, Rin Johnson's piece is, it has a beautiful moment at the end where um, he writes, um, I think I'd pref prefer to be water in a dam or an excavated hillside. I'm seeping into the ground. Everything I've known will be will be altogether different, and I'll know exactly who to blame. And so, uh, you know, and thinking about a hole as a again as something to be filled, or that some like that's some that um, something can be dispersed inside of it, or be it can be a part of the landscape. It can it can um, I, I think thinking about water too as 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 a as a, as a moment that I see a connective tissue uh, in terms of how people are using ice and water and, and form to, to fill um, and compose holes as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, GE. <laughs> um, thank you, GE and everyone who asked a question and um, to Lewis and Charlie and Fawn and Sam. Um, it's a tradition here at The Rail that we end all of our conversations with a poetry reading. And I'm thrilled to welcome our poet of the day, Andrew Lee. The work of artist Andrew Lee encompasses sound, the moving image, drawing, and sculpture, and examines sensory perceptions through the use of language, experience, and space. His practice explores themes that range from the relationship between sounds and the meaning in language, the phenomenal, phenomenal, I'm sorry, phenomenologies, I'm sorry, of the diasporic and how memory and migration perform new imaginaries. Welcome to the stage, Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to the to the Brooklyn Rail for for having me and and to the contributors. Um, I'm, I'm truly honored. Um, despite you know maybe feeling particularly raw today, it's it's raining where I am, and as someone from the West Coast. Um, there's something about the rain that 
kind of requires you to kind of adjust your body i think like like the pressure change or or the sound of the rain kind of permeates your your ego boundary in a way that i think makes you feel like you're 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 bound to bound to the earth or or bound to something and i mean i i could also be feeling raw in general because of the you know the general onslaught of malaise of living under like capitalism but um I, i'm here to read and so so i'll read and um the the titles of the work the titles the multiple titles of the work are embedded within the writing so um i'll just begin an attenuation of presencing whatever that thing is that we can point to distinguished only by a name. That thing that gives shape and our hearing some of the time, I am that thing. Our bodies or my body, that site where intercultural collaboration happens, the grounds of competing cultural difference playing out in all the similar hegemonic structures of dominance versus subservience. This humming ebb and flow, the worrying of the note is a vibrational space of the body. And this sound moves out into the world. What sound did that skin? A chasm of portals that created both fools and those that suffer for the truth. Sometimes the things that are in place were meant for somewhere else. And this creates a perfect confusion of the continuum of things as they leap from moment to moment, a discontinuity with in continuity. The vibrato in Kilimanjaro Dinkau, sung by the Bulgarian state radio and television female vocal choir. The lead voice in this song is a lasso, an approximation of here and there an oscillation of then and what is to come. You can trace its movement. Your eye can pass through it. The surround, where life happens for those that lack the permissions of presence, like an echo moving further away from its source, a foam that sits atop of the sea, a nest of frequencies hovering in the ceiling, the very limits of our comprehension, a register in the back of our minds, the space of imminence, a type of potential, a compassion for that which that has not yet arrived, not just for the sick and dying world, but for oneself, for the inability to give any more. There is victory in no more. There is victory in the void, its fullest expression. When you sing in a congregation from the hymn book, you are engaged in a simultaneous act of language, song, and performance that is a transfiguration of these modes that constitutes what most faith-based practitioners call worship. You are within the body and the sound is produced from the body. The sound is then released from the body and that sound becomes indistinguishable from one body to the next. Your singular voice resounds and expresses the congregation while simultaneously giving form to the negative space of the architecture. The singular voice is heard as a chorus. If one believes or if one has faith, the sound within you was produced by the one you are singing to. As Minha would articulate, the one is the all, and all is the one, and yet the one remains the one, and the all the all, not two, not one either. In the absence of presence, a multiplicitous, a multiplicitous approach that extends this project across disciplines, we must include the worlds that have been lost, destroyed, or stolen. We must include our mothers. So we close our eyes in order to be fully perceiving rather than already knowing. And so we wait for the sound and walk backwards with it. 
the distance expands like a volume of desire and the threshold moves across other thresholds. Where is the living heart of the song? Where do we find blood? In the universe, there are no straight lines, only revolutions, where movement is both a distance and a return. Like the versions of you that exist in the memories of others, the Sanjo of the body, it's in the music. We are remembered by other subjectivities, like the neural network of breath and air, this image, like an echo, moves away from its source, but remains in relationship and is altered by every surface. The song, as I think of it, is a type of wake work for some of those that experience distance, separated from home, family, and land. The song is a fabric of the unintelligible and immaterial, the material that fills the gap between the lost elements of memory when we think of the diasporic subject or those in exile or the phenomenology of migration, we are also thinking about the distance between spaces and how the subject performs the articulation of that distance. The diasporic person embodies several temporalities where the concept of home is captured like a recording, where in its amplification, the song is a referent of what was and is an expression of what is. Abundance is the only way this is possible. Like prayer, we focus in on the telling, the things we wish and desire. We receive the universe, the softening of representation's power to figure a thing. Every song I write spends its knowledge so that on the other end of that thing, we are not with more knowledge, but with experience. The song becomes a memory and every performance an iteration. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was amazing. Um, and thank you to Lewis and Fawn and Sam and Charlie. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive. You can view today's event and our full archive on the Rails YouTube channel. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and in our public events like here in our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at The Rail. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a poetry reading curated by Anna Gurton Watcher. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as we leave. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, you guys. Thanks, Sam. Thank you so much, Andrew, for this poem. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you, Fawn. Sam. Thank you. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs>